Good afternoon. My name is Jelena Jankic and I'm part-time professor at the Global Governance Program at the European University Institute's Robert Schuman Center for Advanced Studies, where I also co-direct the Global Citizenship Observatory. Uh, before coming to the EUI, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Edinburgh, where I worked on the project the Europeanization of Citizenship in the states of Southeastern Europe. Um, I've taught public policy at UCL School of Public Policy, and also I finished my PhD at the University of Cambridge, um, well, more than a decade ago. Um, my research is essentially two-pronged. My more recent work focuses on the global market for investor citizenship, where I look at issues surrounding the sale of passports. So um, in addition to this prong of work, I also focus on the Europeanization of the Western Balkans, which is a research area where all of my work has been rooted. And this is something that you can see if you take a look at the list of my publications, especially my first monograph published in 2015, uh, which is on the Europeanization of citizenship uh, in contested states. So what I tried to look at is how contested states, also the three countries that we are looking at today, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia and Montenegro, how they conceive of their citizenship policies and how they change them in the context of Europeanization. Also, my work on the Europeanization of the Western Balkans uh, has generated the recent edited volume with my colleagues Søren Kyle and Mark Mesic, and the title is obviously the Europeanization of the Western Balkans, a failure of EU conditionality with a question mark, and the question mark is there precisely due to the issues that we will discuss uh, during today's, um, today's talk. Uh, so I will for a moment now ask you to bear with me while I set up the PowerPoint. Um, this is the first time ever that I have been using Zoom for recording, so I hope that um, this will be comprehensible. As you know, I was supposed to be there with you in Trento today and uh, essentially, I am very sorry that the circumstances in which we live now uh, and in which I hope that all of you are safe and healthy have prevented me from coming uh, there and delivering this talk to you. Uh, Professor Roberto Belloni has kindly invited me uh, to the university to give the talk uh, which is entitled, as you can see on the screen, the Europeanization of Contested States in the Western Balkans, uh, reality or fact, question mark. As you can see, uh, I do like question marks and there will be uh, an opportunity for you to ask me questions. Uh, I will leave my email on the last slide. So in case you would like to follow up, in case you had any questions or in case you uh, disagreed with anything um, that I will say in the next 40-ish minutes, uh, please do let me know, write to me, and I'm happy to follow, follow up with you. So uh, the PowerPoint will be very basic uh, because they are tools in a way for bad presentations. So they do not follow verbatim what I will be saying, but rather it gives you an outline of the structure of what I'm going to do today. So the goal of today's talk is to examine how the process of Europeanization functions in contested states. Uh, whether it meets the expectations of the political elites, of the public, etc., the problems it encounters, uh, and also how to assess the success of this, uh, of this process in different types of states. Now, to explore this, uh, we will first look at the process of Europeanization in itself. And we'll try to compare how it is understood in the literature 
on EU integration, which is where uh, this concept, as you will see in a minute, has been rooted. Secondly, how the concept has been used in the literature on transformation of Central and East European countries or the post-communist states which have entered the European Union in 2004 and 2007, and also how it is and how it should be viewed in the context of the Western Balkan states. And these states have their own specificities. And my argument today, and the argument of the bulk of my work, is that these particularities are very much important. In the context of the Western Balkans, this is significant because most of the countries are something that we would call contested states. So the two concepts that we'll try to unpack today uh, to start with are the concept of Europeanization and the, contact, uh, and the concept of contested states. So after looking at how these two concepts uh, have unfolded in the academic literature and how they have been applied over the last 10 years, we will end with an analysis uh, of how the workings of Europeanization function in three contested states, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia and Montenegro. And to do so, we will focus at three domains. Uh, and these three domains can best explain how stratified the notion of Europeanization is and why it is so, so easy to criticize it as a failure. I'll come to the case selection later when we come to the uh, issues of examples. But I think you will understand why we have chosen Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, and why those three uh, particular policy areas, including the rule of law, constitutional reform, and citizenship, uh, and citizenship policies. Now, to start the conceptual part of the presentation, now we'll start with the concept of Europeanization. And the notion of Europeanization is very much rooted in the studies of European integration. In there, uh, it has been defined as the domestic adaptation to regional EU integration. And this is a definition uh, that has been put forward by Martin Fink and uh, Paolo Graziano back in 2000 and uh, 2007. Yet what uh, Europeanization has become is a buzzword and this buzzword is used to analyze institutional, political, social, and economic transformation that essentially takes place not only within the EU, but also in countries that aspire to EU membership. And this Europeanization happens, if you wish, uh, through three different mechanisms. Uh, as you can see on the screen, these mechanisms include coercion, conditionality, and socialization. The conditionality mechanism, in a way, transforms the aspiring members into countries that will be capable of integrating into the EU. And it does so through something that's called the carrots and sticks mechanism. So there are incentives for compliance. So in other words, if you're being a good boy, you'll get a cookie. Uh, and there are sanctions for non-compliance. So you're, if you're not behaving well, no cookie, but not only no cookie, you won't be able to go out and play with your friends. Uh, in the context of actual norm compliance, this means that countries are often rewarded for the advances that they make in the process and face sanctions if they don't comply. And these sanctions uh, nowadays are mostly in the form of financial assistance towards the uh, recipient state or towards, towards the state that seeks succession to the, uh, to the EU. The second mechanism is the mechanism of imposition. And as the word itself says, it implies direct governance by the EU. And this is something that has happened in some of the Western Balkan states. 
including Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. We have elements of direct governance by the European Union, which has the uh, powers to impose some aspects of legislation in these Western Balkan states. The third mechanism is the one of socialization. And this is a sort of a very, very soft mechanism. And it's a me mechanism of learning by doing, learning by seeing how others do it. Um, this is a mechanism that essentially is perhaps uh, something that's least visible in the Western Balkan states because of the particularities uh, of the country's systems. So what's interesting is to see how the interplay of these three mechanisms actually functions in the Western Balkans. And the argument is that the combination of socialization and conditionality mechanisms so if you wish, the softer mechanisms of Europeanization can work well and across a broad range of areas, but only if the states are consolidated, meaning that they are not very challenged, that they are not internally or externally destabilized. And these are the basic preconditions for the socialization and conditionality mechanisms to essentially function well within the acceding countries of the Western Balkans. By contrast, the combination of conditionality and imposition is more effective in cases of contested states and in cases especially that touch upon the core of national sovereignty. And this is very interesting because uh, national sovereignty is at the core of the very EU integration project. This is something that differentiates Europeanization that takes place in the Western Balkans from Europeanization that essentially has taken place uh, in the current European Union or the old European Union member states, if you wish. So after the Second World War, after the 60s and the 70s and 80s and uh, et cetera, et cetera, the European Union member states essentially pulled sovereignty. So they gave away bits of their sovereignty for the common European project. Why is giving a bit of sovereignty to the European Union more difficult in the Western Balkans? The issue is that in the 1990s, most of the Western Balkan states have essentially gained their, regained their sovereignty. So from the former Yugoslavia, et cetera, et cetera. And some states have fought wars or have been in prolonged protracted conflicts and transitions to establish that sovereignty. And this essentially means that sovereignty is far more difficult to give away for these countries. I know it sounds counterintuitive uh, because all of these countries have come out of one union in order to join another one. So in a way, there's this constant process of giving away sovereignty and gaining it back and the tension uh, between the two processes generates problems uh, in the course of Europeanization. Now, importantly, uh, the Europeanization of the Western Balkan states is very much different in terms of dynamics than the Europeanization that uh, essentially takes place in the member states of the European Union. And this is the case because if you're Italy, for instance, is a member state of the European Union, this means that obviously Italy will download European Union uh, regulation and implement it within the country itself. However, when European Union regulations are made, there are Italian representatives who actually sit there and decide on those rules. So there's this two-way process of downloading European Union norms and essentially uploading it. But it works only if you are a member state. If you're not a member state, as is the case of the Western Balkan countries, to become a member, you need to download norms. 
when it comes to uploading, your power is limited. So essentially, it's a one-way process where any feedback from the Western Balkan countries is taken into account as adaptation, not of the rules, but of the process uh, of the process itself. Obviously, a very important characteristic of Europeanization in the Western Balkans is that the process is unlike the cases of Central and Eastern Europe, um, European countries that joined the EU in 2004, but also Bulgaria in 2007, Croatia 2013, uh, is the uncertainty of the process. So you have to think about the fact that most of the Western Balkan states uh, gained independence uh, in the late 80s, early 1990s. Um, and essentially, it has been 30 years since. Uh, after the Thessalonica agenda in 2004, there has been a promise of EU integration for these countries. However, um, there have also been quite a lot of changes on the EU side. In a way, the EU is experiencing an enlargement fatigue. The 2007 enlargement and also to a great extent the 2004 enlargements have generated quite a lot of, let's say, um, internal uh, dissatisfaction within the European Union on the functioning of the EU and its institutions after the succession. And this has generated essentially a change in the accession process in itself. So standards that countries have to fulfill in order to become members have increased. At the same time, there is less certainty. As I mentioned, the Thessalonica Agenda of 2004 stipulates the promise of EU membership uh, to the Western Balkan states if they comply with the EU's rules. Yet it says nowhere when that accession would potentially happen. So without a clear timeline, the Europeanization process in the Western Balkans is becoming very much uncertain and far less credible. And this makes the NORP compliance, it makes the adoption of rules, it makes transformation and change far more difficult. So just to reiterate, uh, Europeanization process that is working right now in the Western Balkans is very much different from what we have had in the European Union in its member states, but also very much different from Europeanization that has happened in Central and East European states. And it's very, very, very much uncertain, which hampers the process itself. So you have this, in a way, if you wish, circular process in which um, in which there is no real progress uh, in the course of uh, in the course of Europeanization. Where we can see this in particular are the contested states of the Western Balkans. And contested states are those countries that are either contested internally by a significant part of their population. And this means that groups are challenging the territorial borders of the state. Uh, they are seeking independence within those states. So, for instance, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have the case of the Republika Srpska, which is formally and territorially a part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it does have a lot of independence-seeking tendencies. Or groups seeking uh, better inclusion within the state. So examples would be the Albanian community in Macedonia or the Serb community in Montenegro, which are integrated. They don't seek territorial independence, but they seek different institutional accommodation of their, of their claims. Contested states can also be contested externally. Uh, when a, a state is contested externally, there are challenges either to its statehood, if you wish, or to the way it articulates and constructs its national identity within the country. 
Uh, and essentially, there are different examples of these external contestations. So if you think about Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, you can think about the Serbia's support to the Republika Srpska. Uh, if you think about Montenegro, uh, you can also think about uh, Serbia's uh, support to the Serbs in Montenegro in terms of contesting Montenegrin independence, especially in the period between 2006 and 2008, or the questions of the name in North Macedonia, uh, the contestation of the Macedonian uh, language and, um, and culture by Bulgaria, etc., etc. Now, in the countries that we are going to look at today, these contestations have resulted in three different governance structures. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, after the Dayton Peace Agreement, uh, has become a multinational federation. This means that the country has quite a lot of veto players. And this is significant because it hampers the process of Europeanization uh, in the country at many levels. And you will see this, uh, this in, in a minute. Uh, in the case of Montenegro, uh, which is a unitary state, uh, there is no formal power sharing. The essential uh, composite of the state is uh, unitary, uh, and uh, the state functions through, uh, let's say, the sharing of power between groups through informal rules. So coalitions are made where they include minority partners, but minority partners do not have veto pow powers within the governance structures. Uh, in the case of North Macedonia, uh, the state has, uh, since the Ohrid Framework Agreement, um, the state power uh, has been uh, decentralized, meaning that there is a power sharing agreement in place between the uh, Macedonian and uh, Albanian communities that live, uh, live in the country. So you can see we have a federal state, a decentralized state, and a unitary state, which have been uh, products of this state contestation, internal and external, uh, external, if you wish. So the argument is that Europeanization will have a different effect in each of these countries. Yet not only, uh, Europeanization will have a different effect in each of these cases, also across different policy areas. So what I propose to do now is to illustrate this by briefly looking at three areas of Europeanization in the three countries. So we will look at the rule of law, as the first area of analysis. And we are looking at the rule of law because of, um, of the fact that the rule of law has been included as one of the uh, conditions enshrined in the Copenhagen criteria for accession. And obviously it permeates the EU's a key. So the rule of law is enshrined in several of the key's chapters and is an integral part of the process of Europeanization itself. The second area that we are looking at uh, during the rest of the speech is the constitutional reform. And constitutional reform uh, in itself is not a requirement uh, for, e is not a formal requirement for EU accession. What does this mean? There's no chapter in the EU a key that says you need to change your constitution. However, uh, the interesting bit is that you actually have to do it. Uh, and I will explain why when I come to the constitutional reform section in a minute. But constitutional reform is also integrated in the EU's a key in the context of other, other issues. And it has been a requirement, for instance, in the cases of Slovenia and Croatia, prior to EU accession, 
uh, whereby they essentially had to reform their constitutions in order to uh, allow uh, some of the EU's uh, regulations, and I'll come to this as well in a minute, uh, to be implemented in these countries. And finally, uh, citizenship policies, uh, they're not directly a part of the accession negotiations. However, they have become indirectly a part of the process through uh, additional conditions related to democracy and human rights and also through instruments that are enshrined in the mechanism stipulated by the Council of Europe, by other uh, international, international bodies. Now, why am I focusing on the three countries that uh, we are looking at today, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, North Macedonia, and Montenegro? Uh, I still do have to use, uh, I still do have to get used to using North Macedonia, so I apologize, it's not my intention. Um, to be offensive to uh, anyone, uh, but it's perhaps sometimes I might make a slip uh, in this regard. Uh, I've chosen these cases because of their common institutional history of being a republic in the former Yugoslavia. Now, obviously, some of you may wonder, okay, so why is the case of Kosovo, which is obviously a contested state, not included in your analysis? Uh, the reason for that uh, is because Kosovo does not say, have the same institutional legacy of being a republic of the former Yugoslavia. Um, and republics have had their own mini constitutions within the federal structures and their own constitutional workings. So it's a sort of a separate case and my argument throughout this speech is that it should be viewed in a separate way because its institutional development has been very much uh, different from the three cases examined, uh, examined here. Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia and Montenegro are also cases that are contested both internally and externally, as I have mentioned a little bit before. And they are at different stages of the accession process, which shows the different workings of Europeanization in countries and across policy, um, policy areas. So without further ado, uh, I will switch to the case of the rule of law, which is an essential element of the European Union's enlargement agenda. It is at the very heart of the enlargement process because unless you build stable states and healthy states, you won't be able to adopt the norms that are um, in place on the European Union side. And in the three cases in Bosnia, Herzegovina, North Macedonia, and Montenegro, we can see similar deficiencies in the rule of law. We can see captured states where political elites exercise political power over the governance structure. And the examples for this are, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where the Republika Srpska block the independent appointment of prosecutors and judges uh, through a high judicial and prosecutorial council. And this means it's exercised its political uh, vetoes to block uh, part of the European Union, uh, Europeanization, uh, Europeanization process. In North Macedonia, for instance, several years back, there has been uh, the case of wiretaping. Uh, and this case of wiretaping revealed that several government officials have been engaged in corruption. And this has been evidenced by the leaked tapes uh, that some of the opposition uh, parliamentarians have in a way found and released to the public, essentially pointing to high level corruption in the country. And obviously in the case of Montenegro, there has been a complete political and economic capture of the state by the ruling elite 
uh, ever since the anti-bureaucratic revolutions of 1988 and 1989. Uh, so you have the dominance of a single political party and the divided society. Uh, the result of that is obviously uh, the capture of the state structure by political, uh, by political elites. Now, as I said, constitutional reform is a very important aspect of the European, uh, Europeanization process. Uh, constitutional reform needs to be implemented to allow for the supremacy of EU law. And obviously, it is very, very difficult and sometimes countries are reluctant to implement this constitutional reform. I'm going to give you the example of the case of Croatia, uh, which waited up until the last days to modify its constitution and allow the extradition uh, of its nationals if required under EU treaties. Uh, the requirement to extradite the country's own nationals uh, is something that's normally regulated uh, through bilateral agreements uh, between countries because one of the core duties of the state is to protect its own nationals. So what happens in the European Union is that there has been a judicial arrangement that is called the European Arrest Warrant, which requires EU member states to extradite their own nationals uh, if they have committed one of the crimes that are listed in the directive. So Croatia, to be able to accede to the European Union, was required to change its constitution, which was forbidding the extradition of Croatian nationals. And the country essentially waited until the wake of the uh, European Union accession. So up until the moment when uh, accession was certain in order to uh, change its its constitution and there have been uh, follow-up cases so if you wish some literature on this I'm very happy to uh, to recommend it to you. Yet changing the country's constitution especially since it's the core issue related to sovereignty it's the national constitution it's the articulation of who we are is even more difficult in countries that are more institutionally complex and this is obviously due to uh, the number of veto players which block constitutional reforms because for constitutional reforms, you normally need super majorities. So the most obvious example of this is the constitutional reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the Bosnian constitutional setup currently foresees that you can run for the country's presidency if you're a Bosniak, a Serb, and a Croat. So this essentially reflects the power sharing arrangements uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, but what does this mean? This means that if you're of any other ethnic belonging, belonging to any other ethnic community and living in Bosnia, you actually don't have the right to run for presidency uh, in the country. So uh, in the 2000s, uh, in 2010 essentially, the European Court of Human Rights uh, adopted a very important decision, uh, Sejdić and Fincy versus Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, in Sejdić and Fincy versus Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Dervish Seido and Jakub Finci, a Bosnian Roma uh, and a uh, member of Jewish community, actually challenged the constitution of the country for being discriminatory in the uh, context of, um, of uh, individuals who are not belonging uh, to one of the constituent peoples of, of the country. So the ECTR, uh, European Court uh, ECTHR, um, ruled 
that Bosnia and Herzegovina's constitution has been in violation of international human rights standards and that the country to meet the standards uh, of international human rights should change um, its constitutional setup. Now, the ruling has been adopted in 2010. We are in 2020 and it's been 10 years and very little has been made uh, in terms of constitutional reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And despite several attempts and proposals on how to, uh, in a way, uh, how to enable each citizen and not only the members of the constituent peoples in Bosnia and Herzegovina to run for presidency, uh, these attempts at changing the constitution have not been uh, have not been successful. Now, in the case of uh, North Macedonia or at some point Macedonia, uh, constitutional change eventually did happen. And it happened twice, once through the Ohrid Framework Agreement in the early 2000s, when it was essentially a requirement to um, halt the conflict that was uh, ongoing, uh, the brief conflict that was ongoing in, in the country. Yet, the most significant constitutional change of uh, altering the name of the country from the Republic of Macedonia to the Republic of North Macedonia uh, took almost 30 years to materialize and only recently has the country um, changed its constitution in order to uh, materialize its uh, its new name and thus make a step forward in the EU accession, accession process. In the third case that we are looking at, in the case of Montenegro, uh, and this is interesting because constitutional change had happened and it was a direct requirement uh, for uh, obtaining uh, the opening of EU accession negotiations. Uh, so essentially the Montenegrin constitution uh, after independence has been adopted in such a way that it foresaw a certain electoral system. One of the um, requirements of the European Union uh, to Montenegro to uh, be able to progress in the accession process has been a clear requirement to change the electoral system and hence uh, do a modification in the country's con uh, constitution. Uh, the way it does, why political parties and the different political actors in this contested states came together and made this constitutional change happen was essentially a clear promise, a clear reward from the EU side um, that they would get ahead uh, in the process of uh, of accession to the uh, to the EU uh, uh, the process of accession to the European uh, to the European Union. Now, in the context of citizenship, which is something as we mentioned. Uh, that's not formally required, but ingrained in different ex uh, aspects of the Europeanization uh, process, we can recognize some of the, uh, some of the same uh, dynamics. So Europeanization has been successful in the cases of three contested states that we are looking at today, in cases when it has been accompanied with very clear rewards. And I think the best example for this is the visa liberalization process, which took place between 2008 and 2010. And visa liberalization process essentially uh, meant that the citizens of the Western Balkan states uh, would no longer require visas for a visit to the Schengen countries um, for stays of up to 90 days within six months periods. And these visas have been required and I'll tell you a little bit more about my own experience in, in a minute. So between 2008 and 2010, 
the European Commission adopted the so-called roadmaps, which were essentially a series of conditions. Uh, and these conditions included border security, identification, asylum policy, and obviously human rights. And most of these uh, requirements essentially focused on the needs of the EU, but, and not of the Western Balkan states, but what happened was that the countries of the Western Balkans made changes to their legislation. They made changes uh, to their legislation in different domains, whereas that change has not been possible for almost two decades, such as the establishment of the ombudsperson in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or the identification and registration of the Roma population, or the change to citizenship policies to tackle the issues of the internally displaced persons of refugees. Uh, yet, why has this been possible? This was very much possible because policymakers could clearly show the benefits of visa liberalization to their citizens. And just to give you an example, uh, in the late 1990s, or actually throughout much of the 90s, um, I was, if I wanted to travel pretty much anywhere as a citizen of Montenegro, I would need to go to the embassy, get into a long queue, and essentially hope that I will get to enter the embassy and then uh, submit quite a lot of documents and get a very short-term visa, uh, which would enable me to enter any of the Schengen countries. And most of the citizens uh, in the Western Balkans, including myself, uh, would have been exceptionally happy to see visa policies of, uh, to see the visa requirement to uh, enter the European Union uh, disappear. And this gave policymakers a big push because in this case, and for this reason, um, even very difficult requirements of the Europeanization process were possible to materialize, were possible to be implemented. Uh, and this was the case, as I said, because it was easier for policymakers to justify these things to citizens, again, because the reward for compliance, uh, the reward for getting ahead in the process uh, was very, very clear and it was credible and it was palpable and it essentially happened. So this brings me uh, to the con conclusions to uh, my speech uh, for today. So if we start from the question mark from the beginning of the presentation, whether the Europeanization of contested states in the Western Balkans is reality or fad, I would say that it's a reality. However, it is a very different reality and it's often a very troubled reality. The process of Europeanization in the Western Balkans is slowed down by the uncertainty of the accession process. So we have the enlargement fatigue, if you wish, among the member states of the European Union due to their negative experiences from the 2004 and 2007 enlargements. But also we have the accession fatigue on the side of the Western Balkan states, which have been in the, let's say, waiting room for the European Union for quite a long time. So essentially also the process of waiting does not contribute to uh, the speed or the success of Europeanization in this, um, in this countries. Uh, the process is also slowed down by the domestic political elites who have the strongholds of political power in these states. And they have the strongholds on political power in the contested states precisely because state contestation challenges state sovereignty. So I think I'll leave it at this. 
Uh, I thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Uh, I wish I were there in person, uh, but I hope that I have left you with some food for thought. And please email me any questions that you may have about this talk or some reflections that you may have. And uh, my email is on the screen. I wish you to stay healthy and I hope to meet you in person someday. Thank you very much.